Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. On today's episode, we are continuing our series uh, on Proverbs, an overview and introduction. Uh, and particularly, the reason we wanted to do this was uh, Proverbs for Peterson fans. Jordan Peterson is coming out with uh, some more stuff on Proverbs, on the psychological significance of the Bible, and I wanted to kind of preempt that and give some people some some good teaching from scholars who know their stuff. And so last time we had Dr. Tremper Longman on and, and he talked about the uh, the biblical phenomena, the the history of, of wisdom literature and, and Near Eastern stuff. And today we're going to be talking with a philosopher, a repeat guest, Dr. Owen Anderson, who has just uh, just a couple books coming out on biblical wisdom, on Proverbs or on Job. And so really excited to get a philosopher's take on Proverbs, as I think it is a, a biblical book of philosophy. So without further ado, Dr. Anderson, thanks so much for coming on the podcast again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Looking yeah. forward to our discussion. Our last one was so good, man. People yep. people were really loving it. So uh, I really am interested in getting your take on Proverbs and yeah. Peterson and philosophy because you're, you're a professor of philosophy and you also teach great books. So yeah. you... You know wisdom, man. You, you're a well, wise man yourself here. Well, I hope so. But yeah, look, this, this one of the things we're going to look at today is, is pride and wisdom. So you would be careful mm. to not become <laughs> pride, prideful. But yeah, I think uh, and I'm, at, I'm at Arizona State University, which is the largest secular university in the country. So I'm uh, I'm interested in approaching this idea that uh, of philosophers in the Bible yeah. and, and what that means. Because I, I think we can make a case that, for example, Job, not Thales, is the first philosopher. Yeah. And then, uh, and that's one of the things I argue in my book that, that is, uh, out right now for looking for publishers. And then, um, what's that book uh, real quick, Owen? Is it, I'm going to, is this titled Job, a philosophical commentary? Yes, dude, I cannot wait for that book. That's me. Awesome. So I'm, I'm trying to do three things in it and I think they overlap well, but I, uh, it's philosophical. So I'm looking at the problem of evil in Job mm -hmm. and I'm treating it like a philosophical dialogue. Yeah. With, with, with uh, the characters involved, in, you know, just like we will look at a platonic dialogue, yeah. And then, I'm, and in that sense, it looks at all of the pro of the solutions I think that people have given to the problem of evil, even up to the present, yeah. And then, secondly, it's theological, and thirdly, it's pastoral. Hmm. So there's a pastoral element in Job because we all wrestle. This is like the universal problem right. that we all wrestle with, and so I think it's not just a detached, abstract discussion about premise, premise, conclusion, therefore God exists, or therefore God doesn't exist. Right. But it touches each of us personally. Yeah. So it could be called pastoral or maybe existential. Yeah. Um, so that, but then I'm also working on biblical uh, wisdom mm -hmm. and what that is in uh, the Psalms and Proverbs, and then down to the Beatitudes. I, I connect up the Psalms and Proverbs to the Beatitudes because I think you'll see how uh, Christ is teaching themes in the Beatitudes that we already had in the Psalms and Proverbs. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge, and and uh, we'll we'll get into Christ and and wisdom and Lady Wisdom uh, further further down in our episode here. But I'm I'm so excited, and that's why I love. Uh, if you guys haven't yet, um, oh, where 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 can they find you on YouTube? Because I love your stuff. I find it on Facebook all the time usually. Mm -hmm. But where, yeah. where can people find your your clips? My yeah. YouTube page is just Doctor Owen Anderson. Okay, so go there and and you'll be able to recognize it because I got my picture up. Yeah. yeah, I do. I have I have lots of different videos. I have little short ones. Uh, topical, but they have longer lectures. And yeah. so uh, I, I try to address a wide swath of questions. Yeah. I, I, would, I watched three uh, three of yours this morning, shorter clips on Peterson and, and Mesopotamian gods and stuff like that. So he's got, for any Peterson fans, go check those ones out. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I actually, I wrote my uh, research paper for Dr. Uh, D.A. Carson here. We had to write a biblical theology and I wrote a biblical theology of wisdom. And as I was reading okay. through through Job, I, I was also reading some Plato at the time, and I thought, this is a proto-Platonic di dialogue. This is exactly. an entire... Yeah, that's what my book does. It's it's so fantastic. It's yep. it's a dialogue with a bunch of different characters. Um, would you say on the problem of theodicy or... or? Oh, yeah, problem of theodicy, but behind that really is the problem of meaning. Yeah. Because when, when we face struggles or mm. evil, suffering, we think the world has no meaning anymore. And that's something Job says very early on, is my life has no meaning. Yeah. So it's not enough for him. If you told him, I'll cure you right now, that wouldn't be enough for Job. He says, the fact this ever happened makes me yeah. not want to have existed. 
Yeah. Yeah, he 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 hates the day of his birth. Right. Yeah. Which that day just skipped out of of the timeline. Yeah. Cuz to to exist with no suffering but also no meaning isn't sufficient. He wants to make sense of it. Yeah. So so in that way I'm I'm making the case that he's doing philosophy way before Thales or yeah, Aristotle or any of the others. Yeah. Man, that's so fantastic. I love that. So um so we talked a little bit about wisdom literature in, in our past one, but uh, I wanted to talk about Plato and uh, the philosopher King, his idea of the philosopher King and whether or not Solomon fits that bill. So uh, in, in Proverbs, you know, a, a great deal of them are written by this King Solomon, who's called the, you know, the wisest man in, in history. Um, yeah. And Plato has this idea of the philosopher King. And when you match those up, it's, it's kind of striking like, Oh, was Solomon already here beforehand? So, uh, Owen, can you help us think yeah. through the, um, the the idea of the philosopher king as it as it yeah. goes from the Republic? And we might have some really n nice overlaps here because we'll have Plato talking about the philosopher king, and he may have someone historical in mind. Mm. He may not, but okay. if he does, I don't think it's Solomon. It's probably an archetype of earlier uh, kings mm. who perhaps came to be the ones that were worshipped as gods. Mm -hmm. So there's this in, in Plato, there's this mythology about Atlantis and places like, like this. So that'll overlap with Jordan Peterson's uh, work in religion. He likes to yeah. pick up on those kinds of things. Yeah. So Arbitrary, kind of thing, yeah. Unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but also just, yeah, that we have these archetypes and a lot of people get excited to say, look, we could put these in the scriptures, mm. but I think we have to distinguish between two lineages coming down of these, the, the fallen, the city of man and the city of God. Yeah. And yeah. if you try to just blur those and say there's just archetypes across both of those that are the same, you're gonna make you're gonna miss a lot of meaning. Oh, okay. So, so I want to follow up on that. Is our, yeah, that's what I mean. There's a lot of threads we can follow here that'll so good. overlap. Real, real quick. Do you would you say that there are um, there are like inspired, whether they're they're God given archetypes and there are fallen archetypes that are corruptions of those, or, or what are you thinking when you did make that? Yeah, well. These seem to be like categories. Mm. So categories aren't, say, fallen or, or regenerate, like the category of good. Mm -hmm. And every culture has some view of what's good. Yeah. And some of them are wrong. So that's where you maybe get into fallen okay. or, or mistaken yeah. or false. Um, so the archetypes are either that, because another example is eternal, what has no beginning. Right. right. And, and if you think that's identical to God, then you'll say, oh, every culture believes in God. Yeah. But that's so far from, that, that's only yeah. one part of God. I need to go much further to get to God, the creator. Right. But every culture thinks something is eternal. Mm -hmm. So th those are kind of categories or concepts that everyone has. But then archetypes might be something like the uh, uh, dying savior. Yeah. yeah. Right. So let's hypothetically say there are stories like that about Nimrod. Mm hmm. And those come down in, say, Egypt or Mesopotamia or Greece. And then, and that's because that culture that time had some vague remembrance of Genesis chapter three. Mm -hmm. They misapply it and they've been looking for the, the dying savior ever since then. Yeah. Uh, but they make it into something incorrect. So Christ isn't just Egypt plus Judaism. Christ is the actual correct understanding of this promise because yeah. because those promises are always something like an angel mm -hmm. or a superhuman yeah. and the godly worship aren't aren't uh, the creator of all things they're more like us that I, I don't think I've ever thought of that before so initially it's like oh that's not very plausible they just have this memory no it, it's very plausible it's the children of, of Adam and Eve and they have this promise uh, in in is it I forgot the actual the verse, but um, in in Genesis three or four, probably three, where God's talking about covering their sin and yeah, chapter the three, the, the yeah, yeah, right, chapter three in the uh, curse after after the fall, after they're questioned, and right they at the end of three, head. yeah, and they say the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, yeah, yeah. and then yeah. God covers them with coats of skin, yeah, yeah. and his. Um, his uh, heel will be bruised, even though the head will be crushed. And so yeah. that idea, you know, you can imagine the, the kids get that and they're talking about it, but there's different tribes splint, splintering off. And so people start, you know, they're sinful. They're not in communion with God. 
and they're saying, yeah, there's going to be the savior and he's going to, his head will be crushed. Oh no, his foot will be crushed. What was it again? And you get yeah. the kind of telephone game going out and well, then yeah, and who, yeah, right. Who, and who, who these are. Cause let's say you have that, but then you also start to worship uh, your ancestors. Hmm. Then the, the one who does this might be one of your ancestors reincarnate. Hmm. Right. So you get the, now, now incidentally, what's interesting is in the biblical timelines, uh, in terms of the ages, you have overlap of ages. So it's not the telephone game for generations and generations, right? Okay. You might have Adam in, in the biblical uh, age of life, Adam overlapping with Noah. Because he lived so long. Yeah. Yeah. Or, 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 and, or definitely Noah's uh, father and grandfather. So mm -hmm. you're not hearing it like through 10 people, you're hearing it directly. Yeah. So then Noah continues that knowledge to this side of the flood. Yeah. And can tell. Uh, Shem this directly. So that's only two removed. That's not like a hundred people between me and what that's happened. That's but then, then you have to think about how is it processed by a fallen person, right? So mm -hmm. then you have a ruler like say Nimrod who wants to consolidate power around the world mm -hmm. and do this by building great cities to himself, a kind of, you know, perhaps Gilgamesh, right? So how does he understand these same things? He, he He's going to have to try to fit it into his framework. Yeah. And so then we have stories that, that's why I, I would say it's not enough to say, look, there's a dying hero, therefore Christianity. No, I mean, that, that's that's only one presentation of that. There's yeah. other ones that you have to show are false if you're going to get to Christianity. Yeah. So I always, I always hear the opposite direction, though. Look, there's a dying hero, so not Christianity. It's just like all the other. Or you, you hear about the flood myth and the, flood, the various accounts of flood narratives. And this one was only, you know, this wasn't global. And, and it makes sense, given what you just talked about, that. It's it's being passed around. It's the same phenomena, but it's being interpreted differently by by sinful people in different times and different periods. And so we, well, we if it, if it did happen, we would expect to find other places. Yeah, if you have everyone in your neighborhood talking about an event, mm -hmm. even though they have different versions of the event, the event probably happened, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and then we have to do the work of getting to the what really what really was it like? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think I would go either way. I wouldn't say therefore Christianity or therefore not Christianity. Here's yeah. how I would proceed. Uh, I, I think we can know from the creation that only God is eternal and God is a creator of everything. Mm -hmm. So I would rule out from the beginning any view that denies that. Yeah. yeah. Right. So if if Osiris and the and, and the Egyptian gods are finite beings who didn't create anything, then then that's not a correct view of things, right? right. So that's that's not that's not Christ or a Christ figure at all. Yeah. yeah. It's not enough to say someone suffered for a cause because lots of people suffer for causes that are false. Yeah. So just yeah. because just because uh, Osiris suffers doesn't make him a Christ figure. Right. Yeah. 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 That's so good. So so we talked about we we're digressing on uh, archetypes and how they 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 come to be and how we come to have them today. And yeah, we got there from the philosopher king. Yeah, and and so so bringing us to to the philosopher king, and so we can see if if Solomon does fit this or not. Um, can you can you kind of set the stage for us? Um, maybe just just an overview of, of the Republic. What what's it about? Well, the, yeah, the Republic is one is perhaps the main work of Plato. Although it wasn't known to us, it had been lost for centuries until the uh, Renaissance. Wow. So. It's shaped modern thinking, even though you might think that, well, this is an old Greek philosophy book. Well, it shaped modern thinking about politics. Mm -hmm. And it starts off just with this question about what is it to be just mm -hmm. or good? And so it's a dialogue about that question. And they they decide, and, and they, they, in the initial uh, parts, they look at different theories about that. And you get in there uh, a, po a possible copyright lawsuit for token. Did you know that? Because you have the ring of Gyges, which makes you invisible. And okay. if you're invisible, you can do whatever you want and no one will know you did it. Yeah. So this ring brings out who you really are. Yeah. Uh, because you're you're able to do what you really want inside your your heart, so to speak, and no one knows you're doing it. Yeah. Because that you know, say, well, that's what keeps you from being bad is the fear of other people not liking you. Mm. So one of the characters, Thrasymachus, says the best person is someone who's who who uh is wicked. But they, no one knows it. You appear to be good. Hmm. Then you're, you have everyone's praise, and you're also getting things that you uh, want. Yeah. And so Socrates goes to that and refutes that. But then they decide they think they think justice is uh, 
uh, equals being treated equally and getting what they deserve. Yeah. So then they say, well, the way we'll figure out what it is to be a good individual is by kind of blowing up writ large, the individual as society and ask, what is a good society? Yeah. And so they look through different kinds of societies and uh, ultimately Plato argues for the philosopher King. Mm -hmm. And so in Plato, some people think that there's this division that happened because I think he goes where to Syracuse and he tries to mentor the King there who turns out to just stay no good. Yeah. So then supposedly there's a shift in Plato's thinking to the laws. They don't need a King. You need laws. Mm -hmm. so there's some, some question about like the internal development of Plato. Um, but what is it? So, so it leaves a question. What is it to be a good King? Well, it'd be a King who knows what is good. Yeah. And you get the best picture of that for Plato in, in the Republic book seven, where he gives the allegory of the cave. Yeah. And a good person is one who uh, has seen the forms in themselves and is then able to apply that in the world. So wisdom is knowing and the correct application of what you know. Yeah. Not just knowing some abstract things. Cause you, you know, there's kind of that caricature of the academic, right? Who doesn't know how to tie his own shoes and, uh, so they, they know things, but they're not wise. Right. So a wise person knows how to rule. And that's where you get the king part. Yeah. You don't just know things, but you're ruling. Yeah. Now, as a category, talking about archetypes. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. But that doesn't tell us much yet because it all depends what you think is good. Mm -hmm. So in, in the Platonic worldview, I, I don't think Plato gets us to the good. His system is a kind of dualistic system. Yeah. Where you have a demiurge from eternity and you have the material world from eternity and the demiurge fashions the material world to look like the eternal forms and they're yeah. imperfect, which is where you get evil. And so the goal of the human is to uh, escape or exit the material world and go to the pure world of forms. And this takes the Republic ends of course, with a description of reincarnation. This takes many lives mm -hmm. to do it. So that's a whole, that's an anti, it's not just not theistic, it's anti-theistic Yeah. Uh, to try to incorporate Plato I mean, I mean, he makes insights about things that, you, that are true. Yeah. But at, but but as a system, you, you couldn't incorporate, we couldn't fuse that onto theism. Yeah. Right. Like Plato might say two plus two is four. I'm like, yeah, he's right about that. <laughs> but that's not a system. I'm thinking about the systems here, right? The Platonic yeah. system is anti theistic system. Yeah. And the biblical worldview is theistic system. So yeah. now the question is well, do you need revealed religion though? Because now you're jumping to Solomon and revealed religion. So what mm -hmm. I'd like to argue for us today is that the wisdom insights of Solomon are from general revelation. Okay. Plato could have and should have known these things, and that's why Plato is without excuse. Do you think what, what Plato did get right, um, he was, insofar as he was right, he was actually pulling stuff from general revelation? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you, it, there's no place on earth where no, where there's no a people who know nothing. Right. Everyone has insights, wisdom to offer. But again, I'm not thinking about particular truths. I'm thinking yeah. about the system in which we're operating. So, so that'll so help us solve a lot of problems because if someone will say, oh, so you're rejecting all of whatever. Yeah. You know, right. So well, he, he says true things insofar as he's thinking, but the system is ordered from basic beliefs to less yeah. basic beliefs. Yes. That's and the basic point. beliefs are completely false. Yeah. He's building up the system on the truths that we see in reality, but he's going in a, in a wrong direction and his whole system is, yeah, anti theistic. Yeah. So that's one. I mean, that in the history of Christian thought, I think that's been one of the main struggles hmm. is attempting to prove God by either incorporating Plato or Aristotle. Yeah. And again, they're both brilliant and they both say true things, Yeah, but they're not theistic. Yeah. And they, and so you think about Dante, Dante puts them in uh, purgatory, not hell. Mm -hmm. and, and who else is in there? Er Adam is in there. Abraham's in there. Moses is in there. Yeah. Uh, in purgatory with, with Plato and Aristotle. So Plato and Aristotle seem to be exempt from unbelief is without excuse. Mm -hmm. No, they're not right. Their unbelief was without excuse. Yeah. So that's how the Christian world has viewed them is they got so close. They got as close as you can with general relation. I'm saying, no, they didn't. Paul yeah. is still right in Romans chapter one. Yeah. As close as they came, quote unquote, is unbelief still. Yeah. Yeah, the, the kind of battle between those two in theology is so interesting because as, as the legend goes, you know, Aristotle was lost. And so you get the early folks, like Augustine, um, pulling and, and being more uh, Neoplatonistic. And then you you get this rediscovery through through the Muslims of 
Aristotle and then you get the Neo Aristotelians. There's kind of this battle going on, and I think you can still find it today. But then also in, in politics, uh, you see this, this struggle between uh, Plato's view of the government versus Aristotle's view, and it kind of yeah. duels all the way down. I, yeah. I would love to get into that a little bit too. Uh, well, in theology, you'll see it. It's pictured in that in the the uh, school of Athens painting with Plato pointing yeah. up and Aristotle pointing to the five senses. Mm -hmm. You'll get in Christianity that the negative influence of Plato is is uh, otherworldliness mm -hmm. and a false view of the beatific vision. Yes. So the idea there is you want to get out of the body and Book Seven, the Republic, see the forms directly. Yeah. And so Christians think, oh, I know, we'll just push the forms over and put God there. And now right. this is Christianized. And what Plato really meant was the forms. And that's why he's so, he's so close. Cause what he meant by forms, we mean by God. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they say. So right. versus this, instead of noticing this, no, what, what you've just done is you've set aside all the works of God in creation. Mm. You have accepted the Greek view that the creation is imperfect by nature. It's just a picture of the forms and you yeah. have to escape it to get to the forms. And that's not what's taught at all. In the mm -hmm. biblical worldview, what's taught in the biblical worldview is that creation was made good, it's fallen now because of sin, and humans have a work to do, twofold work. One is the work of understanding the creation, which was given before the fall, and it continues through the fall. And the second one is because of the fall, the work of redemption. Yes. So the Greek view put doesn't have that at all, and that's one thing I want to lo look at with with Solomon and how he's presented compared to the philosopher king, because he's presented as very wise, and presented as having done the same sin all of us do. Yeah. And he needs to he needs to repent of that and be redeemed. And you mm -hmm. don't find that in the Greek presentation of their heroes. Yeah. yeah. They may present shortcomings and you have the, the Greek tragedies, but they don't represent sin and the need for redemption. Mm -hmm. yeah, which is where where Proverbs is scripture. So I said earlier the wisdom he's getting is from general revelation, but I'm not suggesting it be taken out of the canon of the Bible. The redemptive part is precisely why it's part of the canon of the Bible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's inspired by the Holy Spirit to yeah. to write this biblical wisdom. Uh, so, as I was uh, uh, skimming the the Republic, I need to read it. No, I need to sit down and just hammer through it. But I saw there's some there's some criteria for uh, the philosopher king um, for for the society ruled by the philosopher king. He's got to have like expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants to build stability and unity, and then order and happiness. Um, do we see this? Is there, is this good criteria? Do you think for for a philosopher king to rule society? Oh, all all three of those. What's that? First one, yeah. expertise. We okay. could also call that skillfulness. Mm -hmm. and that's really what wisdom means. Wisdom means being skillful at something. So you could you could qualify wisdom. You could say he's wise at economics. Okay. He's wise at basketball. He's wise at jujitsu. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, so you have wisdom in something because you're skillful at it. And when we talk about wisdom in general, we're saying, uh, what is it to be a wise human? What is it to lead a skillful human life? Mm -hmm. And that's going to require that you know what is it, what is a human. And if you've gotten creation wrong, you're going to get what humans are wrong. Mm. So if you view humans are a soul stuck in a body, yeah, trying to get out of that body, well, then you don't know what humans are because that's not right. That's yeah. Not true. yeah. I so think that first one, expertise or skillfulness. But what's, what's interesting is, uh, you could have someone who's skillful in one of those areas, but isn't doesn't really know these other things I just mentioned. Yeah. Right. So someone could be good at economics. Uh, let me think. Who is it? I think Dante has the general Suleiman in Purgatory. Okay. And he was understood to be a uh, righteous Muslim in the Crusades, <clears throat> which surprised people. Like, wow, how could we didn't know you could be are an unbeliever and righteous. And so he doesn't go, he gets put in purgatory with the others. Yeah. But, but I, I always thought that was kind of weird. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's that view. Like there's no, there's no moral atheist or something. Like what are you talking about? I, of course, of course people with various beliefs have the ability to, to do good things. Yeah. Um, so you could be wise in one area. You could be an excellent general, but not know your creator, let's say. Yeah. Uh, so, with the philosopher king, we don't we don't just want skillful in politics because you'll get tripped up down the road if you don't also know what it is to be a, a skillful human. Yeah, that's that's so good. And and I'm even I hear about someone being a skillful politician. It kind of rubs me the wrong way. I'm like, Ugh, you know, yeah, all the all the buttons to play. 
Yeah, you know how to blackmail people, right? You know how to get your 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 way, basically, and make money off of it. So we definitely want them to be more skillful uh, in areas uh, way more diverse than just politics. Uh, something I, I spoke with uh, Dr. Longman about was this idea of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. That you know, knowledge is like you know things, you have this knowledge. But as you've been talking about skill, wisdom is skill. It's it's like the proper application of the knowledge yeah. that you have, and so you can know a lot. And, and all of us know these kind of people who were really, really smart, really good on tests, but they had no touch. They, they yeah. had no interpersonal skills. They couldn't apply their knowledge yeah. very well. Um, and then understanding is one that uh, I have a looser grasp on, but it's like, you know, I could know that E equals MC squared. I know that. And if I, if I needed to, maybe I could apply that and I could be wise in that, but I, I could still not understand it fully. I could still not know yeah. why it works or something. Yeah. And so. What do you what do you make of that that breakdown? I do that. I, I use something similar. Okay. Or uh, I might speak more strongly. Of, I, I think that framework's right in the way you just described it, but in other ways, I might speak more strongly of knowledge. Okay. For the Socratic reason, what comes up in the Mino, mm -hmm. which is you can't knowingly do evil. That okay. use of the word "no," I think, is more like what you're describing as understand. Okay. So, so I'm fine with whichever word. I don't like to get into arguments about which word to use, but as long as we have the same concept in mind. Yeah. Whereas then the way knowledge, understanding wisdom, knowledge there is, I would call that acquaintance. Okay. So I'm acquainted with something, but I don't really get it. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe familiarity. I become more familiar with it. I could do the proof, like you said. Yeah. And then understanding is the third one, which I, for me, I would just say understanding and wisdom in this in that way is the same. Okay. So uh, if you understood it, you'd know how to apply it. And, and incidentally, I'd put faith in there too. The, bib the biblical definition yeah. of faith is more like understanding and wisdom Yeah. versus yeah, yeah. blind belief. Yeah. Or just, just assent to it. So like yeah. riding a bike, you can know, you can know how to ride a bike, but you mm -hmm. haven't done it. And so you don't really, you, you're acquainted with it. You know, you, you know that, but you don't know how. And, and yeah, that would be that's, that's a good distinction too. Yeah. No, fam acquaintance, like uh, familiarity with the person's face. Mm-hmm. Like I could, if I'd never seen a person or any picture, but I read their bibliography, I could tell you a lot about them. Yeah. But then if you did a lineup and said, which one is it? I don't know. Right. And so sometimes people make a big deal out of that and say, look, that's what Christianity gives you is that kind of face to face relationship with God. Yeah. Whereas the, the uh, pagans only had book knowledge of God. Hmm. Uh, and, and so that one or the ride your bike one is similar. That's more like a skill of how to do something. Right. And you can read a book about, about it. Yep. And you still fall over the first time you get on a bike. Yeah. And it's true the other way. You could ride a bike really well and not be able to write a book about it. Yeah. That, that really, happens. They talk about that in sports, right? The best players exactly. don't translate to the best coaches. Exactly. I was just going to say sports. And yeah. and it's it's really hard. I, I wrestled my whole life. And then when I would go to, to the kids' club, and I'd be like, just don't, just be better, kid. Just, like, just, just do that. Yeah. Just, just, just grab the like, like, it's really hard to actually yeah. articulate what I've known my whole life. Yeah. So that here's the categories I would put in to explain those things. The mm -hmm. face or the bright on the bike is the cognitive and the non-cognitive. Okay. And if we don't keep those in mind, then the word no becomes very ambiguous and, and we have a hard time with it. So riding a bike is a non-cognitive thing, not propositional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or reckon just picking a face out of a lineup is not propositional. You're not going through a list of propositions in your mind. Yeah. Um, the kinds of propositions you can go through in your mind, if it's a good lineup, they've eliminated those, right? Blue eyes, they all have blue eyes. Yeah. Six foot two, they're all six foot two. So that's eliminated. So you're not going through a set of propositions, whereas the right in the book side is the set of propositions. Yeah. Now, a human can very, with a very little consciousness, I guess, write down a lot of things. Socrates encountered this with the artists in the Apology. Mm -hmm. He said, almost anyone else understands their art better than they do. So someone could write a book about how, how to ride a bike and not really ride a bike well. A computer could probably we can you know have computers write bikes about write books about how to ride bikes and they yeah. couldn't explain it to you. So this is where I would say level of wisdom, faith, understanding come in is the ability to show that you mm. understand. Yeah. And there might be some usually showing is cognitive. In the cases we're talking about, showing might be non-cognitive, like ride your bike. Yeah. Um but when we're talking about God, yeah, could, could you pick God out of a lineup, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Like if you say everyone believes in God deep down, and then you start to get what they believe, you see how different it is. They, wow, no, they don't believe. That's just a placeholder word. Yeah. They don't believe the same things at all about God. Right. So that I, I'm looking, I think wisdom is cognitive, 
but it's proven in the application. So if you say you have wisdom and you don't live a certain way, totally. you don't have wisdom. Totally. Yeah. I love that. I, I love the, the practical application of, you know, wisdom as a path. And we'll talk about lady wisdom and lady folly a little bit. So, so that's, well, that's this is the path though. This is the way. This is the way. <laughs> that's why I said I'm waiting for, that's the Tao, the way. Yeah. So there's going to be a C.S. Lewis Mandalorian book. I guarantee it. Well, it's going to be hard because uh, it, it's going to have to be written by like a libertarian because in the first season, Mandalorian says, you know, oh, weapons are part of my religion. And and all the evangelical fish are going to have a real hard time with that part of it. They'll have to, they'll have to make an allegory. Yeah. But what they'll do is he'll come but along. The Bible. The Bible. By the, yeah, right. That or the, by the third, fourth, he's setting those aside, the weapons aside. Ah, yeah. So he's learning. I already saw people saying this. He started out as a fundamentalist. I saw that too. Yeah, and he's being like, no, no, no. <laughs> Taking off his helmet and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. and all, Christianity teaches us to love each other. Mm. Uh, what religion doesn't say that? I mean, if that's what you think is like unique to Christianity, you're not going to get very far in the world right. religions. Right. So, um, all right. So, getting back, so we have expertise, the the first uh, criteria, yeah. and we have stability or unity, and then the third one would be order. So, can you take us through those? Yeah. So, the first one was the skillfulness idea. The second one, think about the nature of things okay and call this integrity mm. that's where the word comes from integer right same thing a whole number wholeness that's good so at, at the individual level if you don't have integrity you're divided against yourself mm. right imagine if you're trying to train to be a, a wrestler so in the morning you spend four hours uh, training and eating well and then in the afternoon you spend your time eating twinkies yeah like yeah. you're divided against yourself you're not going to make any goals that's great but then he, writ large to the society is the same thing. If the society is divided against itself, it's not going to have any goals, which is point three, the goals. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 uh, philosopher King should know the nature of a society and how to promote that nature through unity. Yeah. You're not divided against yourself. And think about how you could hear, uh, uh the point Christ makes yeah. a, a kingdom divided against itself. So that's a kind of general revelation truth. Yeah. yeah. Lincoln uh, Lincoln civil war, if you're in yeah. a civil war, you're not going to do much. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that, the third one is goals yeah. for Plato is happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the goal of human life? You, you have skillfulness and integrity to get to your final goal. And, and yeah. so we can raise a question about that. I, I don't think happiness is our final goal. Okay. I would say uh, uh, knowing the glory of God as revealed in his works is our highest goal. The side effect of that is we're happy. Enjoying him forever. Yeah, precisely. Okay. But that's not the goal because you could be temporarily happy from a mistaken good. Mm -hmm. The only way, you, so you can't measure if you achieve the good by your experience of happiness, because for all you know, in five minutes, five days, five years, you'll, you won't be happy anymore. Yeah. yeah. The only way to know you have lasting happiness is by knowing you have a lasting permanent goal, which is God. And yeah. God. And, and so if glorifying God is man's chief end, it, it might not always make you happy when you're in the process of glorifying him in, in a hard circumstance. Yeah. Well, especially if we think of happy as a psychological. Yeah. Uh, but James says, count it all joy when you're yeah. in trials. So there's some sense in which you could be like in the, uh, the, the jail in Philippi, you've been beaten. You're probably yeah. hungry, cold and tired and you're singing the praises of God. Yeah. So, so that, so, we have to work on what exactly because the Greeks did mean something more like joy or contentment. Yeah, that's a good point. Then, then the, it, the now they don't mean that. Yeah, yeah, American shallow happiness that we talk yeah. about. Yeah, so you could have your even your trials glorify God. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's good. I love that. So, so that's the the three criteria that we looked at, and I thought this was pretty interesting. Apparently, Plato got um, this idea of the philosopher king. He kind of abstracted it out of looking at Sparta, and he looked at yeah. like the ruling class, and then realized, yeah, we we kind of need um, an, an oligarchy kind of thing, but uh, we need the people at the top to be philosophers and kings. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. uh, I pulled out I pulled out a quote from Socrates. Plato used for those who don't know, Plato used Socrates as his mouthpiece, and uh, he says there will be no end to the troubles of states, or indeed my dear Glaucon, uh, his interlocutor, of humanity itself, till philosophers become kings in this world, or till we now call kings and rulers really truly, those that we now call kings or rulers, until they really truly become philosophers. 
and political power and philosophy thus come into the same hands. There is no other road to real happiness, either for society or for the individual. And so he's going back to that analogy yeah. between the, the individual, the soul, and the society. Yeah, I love that quote because I, I think it's right. You should make your philo philosophers your king. Let's just start now. <laughs> I think I know a philosopher. Who I'll did. be number one up on the list. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's a great quote. In other words, you could have someone who is skillful at making your country rich yeah. and preserving it in peace against its opponents, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to direct your, your, your society towards the highest goal. In that sense, they're not successful. And what's going to happen is this. People will become discontent. Mm -hmm because money and safety aren't going to be enough to keep you content. Yeah. And then they'll start filling their content, their discontent with, with things that bring harm, mm -hmm. excessive behaviors. They'll want to legalize various things. Yeah. And then your society will collapse. So the reason why I need a philosopher King is that the King doesn't just give us order and safety. The King helps us understand the meaning of the world. Yeah. And that is what is more important than those other things. And that's what will bring lasting contentment. Mm. So the problem, I think, with the kings is that Plato encountered was that they didn't know that. Yeah. So however good they were at other things, economics and warfare, they didn't have lasting contentment. And so that's why we can switch to Solomon now and see what happened. That's why I love the case of Solomon, because we're presented with a sinner. Mm -hmm. And... Just like the king of Syracuse may have had failings, but they're not put in that context of needing redemption because the Platonic worldview doesn't have that. Yeah. The biblical worldview gives us Solomon in that context. Yeah. And so he's not, he's idealized. Well, not, I mean, he's humanized. Yeah. He's a human. And as we can look now and get into what did he understand wisdom to be and how can we understand his failings in light of that? Yeah. Well, sins because failings could be non-moral right because right. Right? it might surprise people to say well wait how could the wisest person ever have sin right yeah and and ben I mean, he's a he's a sinner yeah it's like it's it's obvious the bible doesn't uh doesn't whitewash that he it, it gives us it gives us who he really was so we see um maybe right before we go into solomon so for for plato um just a, a summary statement what does it mean to be wise Well, I think wisdom for him would be the skillful application of our knowledge of the highest good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think that that sets us up really well to go into to King Solomon. For for Solomon. Now, now I think there might be a tradition then coming down to us, which views the role of the king then is mm -hmm. to guide us to the good. Okay. Whereas a, uh, and that might be the more platonic one, whereas the Aristotelian one might be more like the goal of the king is to preserve freedoms or abilities in this life for us to pursue the good. Yeah. So the platonic one is especially interested in exercising judgment in this world. Yeah. And the Aristotelian one is especially aimed at modeling what a good life is to the people. That's that. That's interesting. A lot of things are popping up for me. I'm thinking of like Nietzsche's uh, Nietzsche, as Peterson would say, uh, Nietzsche's um, strong man. We need we need the strong man. We need this Ubermensch, yeah. the Superman. I, I think that's more like the Platonic one. Right. Yeah. And the idea is that your soul needs to be guided and purged to have a good afterlife. And mm -hmm. so you can see where some Christians may have picked up on that and said, "Yeah, that's exactly what we need." Yeah. Yeah. And so there's this there's this like there's a strong leader who leads you into the way that you should live lives leads the whole society into the way that that it should be and then i love that that characterization the aristotelian one is like no just protecting each other from each other so that they can all flourish with what the yeah, really more like a model of the wise person to the rest of us yeah and so in interestingly i think you probably could get a picture from both of those of their view of god Okay. The human ruler is a little uh, god, so to speak. Yeah. Where the unmoved mover doesn't actively get involved with any of our lives because the unmoved mover is not even conscious of us. That's, but that's we're our moved, job, right? Yeah, we're moved towards the unmoved mover because the unmoved mover is perfect. We want to become perfect. Yeah. So, so in that sense, you're moving towards it. Okay. 
and the platonic demiurge is actively involved in shaping the things of this world to be like the forms. Yeah. So both of those model yeah. their kings or rulers model how they understand the unmover or the demiurge. That's really interesting, uh, Owen, because it's it's just one level up of a, a abstraction. So Plato's talking about um, if you want to, you know, the the soul, and he uses this analogy between the soul and the society, and then you can go one step further and think about theology in his in his view. Well, and how mistaken views in theology trickle into everything else. It's like Reaganomics. This is what would this be like? The, the theologianomics. Yeah, trickle, uh, all trickle, views of God trickle down into everything. Yeah, trickle down heresy. So the way we understand God's ruling in the world will affect the way we understand human rulers. And that's why a lot of times the, the object, I mean, probably 99.9% .9 of the time, the biggest objection to any belief in God is the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. God is not administering the world. Well, God's yeah. not a skillful ruler. Mm -hmm. If God was skillful, look around the world will not look like this. That's a great way to put it. Holy cow. That's really good. Yeah. God is not, that's the objection. God is not yeah. a skillful ruler. And in contrast to that, we're going to get Solomon telling us just the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, so bring when you think that God is not a skillful ruler, the response in the old days, you had this a saying, don't you fear God? Hmm. And that's an actual, I mean, nowadays it would hold no water, but yeah, that would be an actual saying. Like, you're going to do that. Don't you fear God? Yeah. I can, I can imagine if you said that to me or if my brother said that to me, that would be devastating. Yeah. If I did something and you were like, don't, don't you fear God? Like that would be devastating. It should, yeah. Be. It should be a call to all of us. That's the beginning of wisdom. Is completely absent in Plato or Aristotle because they don't have God to fear. Yeah. And their versions of God, the Emu Mover and the Demiurg, are, are not that great. Yeah, and they're not that kind of thing that that can interact and speak with yeah. you. Which, actually, so uh, Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So so that, that's that that foundation. But for Plato, he I've heard some people characterize him as saying, um, you know, he he did sneak in some revelation through through oracles and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Do you have thoughts on that? Uh, did he did he have to rely still? Yeah. On well, I think so. I mean, that's a central piece of the apology, mm -hmm. and that's what's interesting for all of them. We 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 sometimes we look at the philosophers now through like a new atheist lens. Yeah, I think they're just proto modern day scientists, mm -hmm. but all of them were deeply involved in the occult, mm -hmm. and I think in Plato especially comes out, and we see it down to the present in Neoplatonism, uh, Plotinus and his view of becoming divine yeah. is not like Christianity at all. It's just the straight up occult slash Gnostic teaching. Yeah. This is why it's just troubling to see if you try to wed, say, well, Plotinus said a lot of good things we can put in. He's like, no, this, I mean, it's fundamentally a contrary system. Yeah. So yeah, Plato, uh, when I say the occult, I don't mean he himself was using Ouija boards, but he opens up the idea that, yeah, there's these other spirits who we have contact with. Yeah. And they tell us things. They're called oracles. And and there's a whole, you know, he may have his Greek system, and there's an Egyptian system, and there's a Mesopotamian system, and there's a Chinese system, and a Japanese system. But they all have that similar framework, which is we're kind of lost. Whatever created us way back when is gone. Mm -hmm. And so we have intermediary spirits uh, struggling for us. Yeah. And that's called the Marvel series. <laughs> He, he's going to go at so many different things. That's like just his, his favorite. So <laughs> um, that that's a really helpful point. And actually, when you put it that way, it makes sense. It's like the, the great lie that, that Satan would want us to think the creator's gone. He died. His body's been chopped up or whatever the story is. And there's these intermedi intermediaries who may not be perfect, but they'll help guide us. And you pick, your, pick which one you like. You like love. You go with that. You like power. You go with that. It's like the, the temptation of Paris by the three goddesses. Mm. Uh, do you want, do you want uh, love, power, or military might? Mm. And you just pick which one and you worship her. That's that's interesting because um, God kind of gives that to Solomon, right? He says... Yeah. Let's, he, look, let's look at this again to Solomon. And and so the, and Sally, the thing about Jordan Peterson, the idea of archetypes, I know he people get excited because he doesn't... He affirms... For example, the resurrection. Mm -hmm. but he'll talk about it as a, sort of a deep truth embedded in the human unconscious. Yeah, and for him, it is synonymous to these other stories we've talked about right. in an important way. Yeah, and he may give an evolutionary ex explanation of why humans came to have this. So I think for maybe Christians are used to having academics 
bash them over the head all the time with there is no God. So when an academic comes along and says, hey, actually, these are really important archetypes that are in all of our minds. It's like, yes, this is finally someone who's not just attacking me. But we have to see, no, this is a similar uh, system, an anti-theistic system, right? This is coming to Jordan Peterson from Joseph Campbell through Carl Jung. And, and uh, another interesting point. So I wrote a research paper on Peterson last semester, maybe for religion in the modern world. And I read his uh, maps of meaning and he's doing, he's doing the uh, 20, 20th century version of what Plato's doing by grounding all this in the soul, but instead he's grounding it in the mind. So Peterson talks about, uh, he talks about order and chaos, right? And we find it all over in the world. But the reason we find it is because it's grounded in the self. And so he does a similar move of drawing an analogy between the self and society. Yeah. But it's it's, it's up to date in, you know, brain science and stuff. Well, and he's great for that reason of, of looking at our need for meaning. Mm. And the, kind of this, the crass materialism. Yeah. Philosophical or economic mm -hmm. consumerism or philosophical materialism just doesn't give us meaning. Yeah. So that's why he's great. And that's why it's so attractive to people. It's like, yeah, there's... We need meaning in life. Right. And then the, the other reason is that he just reminds us of, of important prudential truths. Yeah. There's certain simple things you can do to get really far ahead in life. It's not actually that complicated. Yeah. Clean your room. <laughs> yeah. And it's like that's a basic thing that you can do. And it it uh teaches you a kind of discipline and order in your life, which is beneficial in lots of areas. Mm -hmm. So we may be at a place where we need people to hear those kinds of things, right? Right. They they've lost prudence. Yeah. And so prudence is a is a branch of wisdom, but I, I wouldn't want to replace. I wouldn't want to say all wisdom is just prudence. Mm -hmm. You you could be prudential without having the actual good in place, but you yeah. can't be wise without having the good in place. And as you told us earlier, uh, going over the the philosopher king, it won't it won't last either, right? If if you have if you're just prudent. And you have no meaning behind why you should be prudent. Then you become like this, this, you get tyranny. Um, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm being forced to do this by this yeah. prudential ruler or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's like, why, why clean my room? I'd rather spend that 20 minutes playing a video game. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I don't know a lot of details about Jordan Peterson's life. And so I might be liable to get them wrong, mm -hmm. but it seems like he was himself was struggling with meaning concerning the problem of evil when his wife had cancer. Mm hmm. And that led him to try to medicate to avoid the struggle with meaninglessness. And so for Jordan Peterson, the problem of evil is front and center. Yeah. As is for all of us. And, and so that, I, I don't, that, I don't bring that up to suggest yeah. you know with him because we all have that. He's, he's one of us. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But it seems like he hasn't, his system so far hasn't provided him with an answer to that problem. And, and that's something that I've seen too. So, so in doing that and you know, he, I don't, he wasn't setting out to like self-medicate in a bad way. He's a, he's a psychologist, right? So he, he was trying this, this uh, way to help him bol bolster himself in order to care for his wife. Well, and in so doing, he, he got his own firsthand experience of the problem of evil going through this huge mess of a year where he's almost dying on several occasions. And all throughout that, you know, I'm praying that the Lord's using that to to draw him to Himself, which would be just fantastic, man. I would yeah. that would blow my mind to bring him to a point where he sees the limits of Jungian psychology. Yes, and is not providing it gives some of these answers that are prudential, we we'll call them, but it's not providing lasting meaning, and that's what we need. Yeah. And that's exactly what the problem of evil is for. And and that's that's something I've learned from Peterson himself is talking about carrying a burden you know, loading up a burden, you know, uh, taking up your, your responsibility, but it's gotta be one that's worth it or you won't do it. It's gotta be one that's actually worth bearing. And it's like, Dr. Peterson, man, keep coming, keep coming this way because I have a burden for you. Uh, it, the, it's the yoke is light uh, and the burden's easy, but it's the only one that can provide you with the meaning for your life. Yeah. So I think that's right. And when, when someone close to us gets sick, it's you, you for many of us, we would rather ourselves get sick yeah. than a wife or a child. Yeah. So when that happens, it really tests our, our system. Mm -hmm. And I think unless we get to a point of seeing that there is God and we're inexcusable before God, we won't repent of the right things. Yeah. We might say, well, instead of playing a video game for an hour, I could have helped my wife for an hour. Mm. Make changes like that in my life. Yeah. But you have to come to a place where and I think this is where Job gets pushed to. Mm -hmm. You say, now I see you and I abhor myself. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, 
modern Christian ears don't like that. But if you imagine seeing that's something about the beatific vision, like, oh, yeah, we're going to see God. It's like everyone who saw a glimpse of God's robe in the Old Testament, like lost their minds and went into seizure yeah. mode. Yeah. Well, and I don't think what's interesting about Job is he can't mean like, oh, th hey, there's a guy over there with four limbs and a, and a head that look, I guess that's God. God just pointed him to the creation. Mm -hmm. And by understanding the creation, now Job says, I saw God. Yeah. So what Job's repenting of is not having known God from general revelation. Yeah. And and then that brings us again to Solomon about uh, the, the, the God, rather than what the problem of evil suggests, that God is not a good ruler. Uh, Job sees that, oh, I'm looking at your works and you are a good ruler. Mm -hmm. And you know, even even the sickness and death that we see in creation is... It, what, what you uh, helped me see our last episode, it is revelation. It's revelation of his wrath. It's not a corrupted revelation. It is revelation. And yeah. so finally, right. Romans 1 goes, right? We've been left. The yeah. wrath of God is revealed mm -hmm. by leaving you to yourself. Yeah. That's the interesting part is, is like, I'm doing these things. I'm, I'm replacing God with an idol. And because of that, in the future, I'll face wrath. Yeah. Oh, that's not, the, that's not how it's presented. Mm -hmm. Your having done that is your being under the wrath of God. Yeah. God's given you up to a debased mind. To to make those idols. Yeah, that's that's part of it right there. Well, let's look at it. Let's, let's get back to, to Proverbs one and you read seven. Mm -hmm. And in seven, we get two of the three characters I think we'll encounter in Proverbs. Yeah. We have the, the wise person and mm -hmm. the fool. Mm -hmm. And the third one that'll be brought up a little later is called the simpleton. Mm -hmm. So the fool thinks he knows and he doesn't know. Yeah. So there's a combination of that with pride. The simpleton doesn't care to know. He goes along his way, even though it leads to destruction. Yeah. And so for him, it's more like sloth. Yeah. He's like the sluggard who doesn't, he's, he's too lazy to bring the hand out of the bowl of Cheetos to his mouth. Yeah. So he, we love him. We put both the fool and simpleton are, are usually characters in our comedy. Mm -hmm. so our, our, our longest running show is about a family of simpletons. Simpsons. Yeah. The simpletons, the Simpsons, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and so we find that humorous, but it, it could also turn out to be tragic if it has real life consequences. Yeah. Like if Homer Simpson really was in charge of a uh, nuclear power plant, it would be terrifying. Or, or if that's your your family member, it's, yeah, it's not as funny anymore. Yeah, right, exactly. So, but we get introduced to these, and and it, 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 before that, the introduction telling us why we need wisdom. Yeah. To know wisdom and inst instruction, to preserve the words of knowledge, to in receive the instruction of wisdom, judgment, justice, judgment, equity. So that's interesting, getting back to the philosopher king, to learn judgment, justice, equity. Yeah. Uh, and that's true for our own lives, even if we're never king. Do I rule well in my life? Am I a skillful human? Well, and, and that's that analogy again, right? The the soul and the society. So you're 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 needing to exercise that over your own self right you're yeah, starting there yeah that's why what's nice that the scriptures don't let us get away from the reality of sin mm. and we'll talk about that i guess in a moment yeah solomon's greatness he still didn't get out of sin and think about all the traditions this would be great too because there's a whole occultic tradition about solomon oh okay which i think right the masons the solomon's temple secret uh solomon had commune with the dead with spirits so there's this whole tradition i didn't know that the masons found uh, tried to root themselves in, in solomon although yeah, that's when it start, supposedly starts is with the the knights templar and the in the crusades found the secrets of the temple oh and and god gave these god gave wisdom to the the folks who built the the temple yeah so the temple is some kind of a cultic building that lets you yeah. commune with the the spirits or with god so they take it in this yeah. more non-cognitive spiritualist sense yeah and, and if, if anything, Solomon is maybe more now remembered in that way. And the wisdom of Solomon is occult, meaning secret, hidden. You have to yep. figure this stuff out. Now, it yep. does talk about hidden here, but I don't think that's what it means at all. It's hidden from the fool, yeah, from the person whose assumptions won't let them see it. So it's hidden in the way that the Pharisees, that Christ was hidden from the Pharisees. Yeah, it's the it's right a, there in front of them. Exactly, but they don't have the eyes to see because yeah. it's a there's a moral component. Not a uh, not a secret component from whispering in, in corners. And what's I think once you get into these occult traditions, you have to you know build up to get to know the highest secret mm -hmm. levels that you're in. And the highest secret just turns out to be this: all is one. That's what Solomon came to find out. Huh. 
no, like clearly can't be what Solomon came to find out because he affirms God the Creator, not all is one. Yeah, they could have just read Plotinus for that one, man. Yeah, well, that's, what it is. that's exactly the tradition that it is. Yeah, I want to say I, I want to uh, pre preserve Solomon from that mm -hmm. and direct us to the actual Solomon here. Yeah, and what's interesting is right here in uh, verse four to give prudence to the simple. So the simple comes up before the fool. Mm. And especially to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Yeah. So there's something about the youth, particularly. And, and our, I mean, that's that's kind of what Jordan Peterson's ex people get excited about, right? He's excited to the to the uh, younger generation to be hearing this stuff for the first time. And so you wonder where were their parents? Yeah. Why were they teaching them these things? A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Mm. So the proverbs aren't only for the the simple and the youth like if you're wise you can learn even more from reading that yeah. yeah and then seven's that one you read which gives us that great contrast with the fool who is going to be coming all the way down to uh mention the pharisees yeah the hypocrites those who think they know and they don't know and what's what what adds to it because everyone could be a fool in that sense but what puts you into the level of pharisee hypocrisy mm -hmm. is you're teaching others you're leading others in your foolishness yeah you claim to know and you claim to be able to disciple others mm -hmm. and you don't know. And so you're making them twice the sons of hell. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And bl blind leading the blind. Oh, man. That's so terrifying. You know, that's yeah. terrifying. Like someone well, just exactly. so someone that's like Verse 7. Mm -hmm. So we say, well, what does it mean, fear God? That seems yes. unchristian, right? That's Old Testament stuff. Yeah. And I think in our mind, when we think of fear, we think about a horror movie. Mm -hmm. Remember Wes Craven? Made a handful of horror movies. I think he's behind Scream. Okay. Uh, he might have been involved in Halloween. I can't remember. One of those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, craven fear, right? You're trembling in the corner that Mike Myers might come in the room and get you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not what this is. This is more like awe, respect. You would have this if the ruler came in the room. Yeah. yeah. And you know if you smart off, he could do something about it. Yeah. yeah. But he's also good. Mm -hmm. I know C.S. Lewis was trying to get to this about Aslan. Yeah. Says, well, should we be afraid of him? Right. So it's this idea of helping us remember what actual fear is. This fear, in one way, is much worse than if Mike Myers is in your house trying to kill you. I don't mean the comedian. I mean the guy from Halloween. <laughs> yeah. uh, Both would be scary, but yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, that's one level of fear. This is much worse. This is the kind of thing that Christ is getting to when he says, fear him who can, after killing you, put your soul into hell. Yeah. Yeah. So. Plato can't even get there. Plato doesn't have God, which means he can't even start down the path of wisdom, mm -hmm. which is a big problem, right? Yeah. 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 That that fear, um, I used to be confused about when I was a kid. And then uh, I started wrestling. Everything comes back to wrestling for me. But I had this coach, Coach Carlson. Uh, if he's listening, that'd be awesome. But mm -hmm. Coach C was this big old grizzly man. He's the only one in in uh, our high school to ever win state. So his he's got a, a painting up on the wall of himself, and he, he came back to coach at the high school. And he, I, I developed this like this fear, this like reverence for him. Like I love this dude, and uh, but I still I, I respect him. And when he comes in the room, things change because the boss is in town, you know. And and yeah. that was that helped me understand the fear that I ought to have for God. If I feel this way about Coach Carlson, how much more the, the one who made Coach Carlson, the one who's who Coach Carlson is in his image, and he's the imperfect, you know, yeah. uh, image of the the perfect God. Yes, yeah, so let me give some examples from the scriptures because someone might say this just teaches you start with God. You start there. Yep. Uh, in wisdom, yes, but not in all knowing of anything. Mm -hmm. I think. And this will highlight also why Plato can't ever have this. If you think about Psalm 100, mm -hmm. it has one of what I think is the best proofs for God's existence. Simply this, God made us, not we ourselves. That sounds very simple, but that's actually a lot to unpack. Yeah. You're not eternal. Nothing about you is eternal. Mm -hmm. Everything about you is created. Yeah. You couldn't have created yourself, so someone else created you. And that's the one you should fear in this sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you might say, well, Plato could kind of have that. No, because Plato thinks the souls are eternal. Yeah. He thinks they were without beginning. He doesn't think he's created. He denies Psalm 100. But I think what Psalm 100 is telling us is a general revelation truth. Yeah. It's in scripture, but it's general revelation truth. Then go from Psalm 100 to Psalm 19. 
and it lists the creation and the law, moral law, not Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. God is the one who made all those things, and they reveal God. Yeah. Those two Psalms alone, I think, give us enough to unpack to show God exists. Yeah. Have that Solomon would have that in mind. Yeah. Right, from his father. Mm -hmm. uh, writing Psalms. And Solomon would know those things. Their songs. He'd probably sing in them. Yeah, he'd see him growing up, right? Just like we all should. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I like that. So that reminds me a little bit of Descartes. Right after the cogito in not meditations, but uh on the method. Uh, he, he talks about the cogito, I think, therefore I am. And then he immediately goes to, but I, I depend on something. I must depend on something. And he goes into his kind of ontological argument, say what you will about it. But I think he, he is acknowledging exactly what you just said. The reality of dependence mm -hmm. is a good first. I mean, that is something. Say, um. Yeah, know that the Lord, he is God. So there we have Yahweh and Elohim. Yep. Um, it is he who has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So I think what happens in this psalm, which might be a little more than Descartes, and I think it's still general relation truth, not just that God made us as a distant creator or mm -hmm. an abstract creator, but as the one who rules in the world. The Lord. For our redemption. Yeah. And that's why you have fear because you know the condition of your soul is in the hands of God. Mm. That's the beginning of wisdom. If you don't have that, at best you'll have prudence. Yeah, you could be great. You could be. You could be like the uh, wicked manager. Uh, you could be really good at something. Yeah, and you don't get to the fear of God though. Yeah. Now Solomon. So let's see about Solomon. Well, wait a minute. He didn't seem to fear God. What happened with Solomon? I, I, I think what happened with Solomon is what happened with Adam, mm -hmm. and what happened with all of us. And I kind of described it earlier when I talked about excess. Because Solomon's sin, the, the sin of Solomon is excessive in a way where people might think it's a different category. Yeah. I'm going to call that his fruit sin. His fruit sin was excessive in one way that we'll never achieve. But it's the same root sin as all of us. Yeah. And root sin is what Paul describes in Psalm, or in, uh, uh, was quoting Psalm, uh, Romans 3, 10, 11, not seeking, not understanding, not doing what is right. Yeah. When Adam stopped seeking, he believed that he could be his God, knowing good and evil. Mm. When Solomon stopped seeking, he turned to uh, women. Yeah. And Solomon, in his wealth and his wives, does something for the rest of us. None of us ever have to experimentally ask. Yeah. If I had enough money, would I be happy? Or if I just had more wives, yeah. concubines, yeah. then I'd be happy. Solomon answered the question. Yes. Now, you might think, no, he didn't have enough money. <laughs> no one was richer than him in kind. How about prestige, too, right? Like this guy, people are coming all, all over the world. If I was just... If I was just like Jordan Peterson, man, if I just had Same, yeah. subscribers and people came to me asking me, then I would have this sense of purpose. And Solomon says no. Yeah. That's why Solomon's a great contrast, say, with Gilgamesh. Hmm. He wants a kind of fame. He knows he's going to die, but he wants his name to live forever. Yeah. But your name could live forever in infamy. I just your name living forever is not sufficient. But a lot of the pagans have tried to find immortality that way. Yeah, that's interesting. Because, like, my body dies and I go away. I want people here to remember me forever. Yeah. But Solomon, yeah, prestige, people are coming from around the world, mm -hmm. the story of the Queen of Sheba, mm -hmm. to hear his wisdom. But he turns to uh, his wives and their gods. Yeah. And so we see that it'll be true for all of us. If we stop seeking God, we'll have to find meaning and contentment somehow. Mm -hmm. And that will lead in, in, in sin, at least to excessive behavior. Yeah. Never good. You can't just stop here. It's a, like a hyperbolic curve, yeah. right? Maybe starts like that, but it keeps yeah. going and it's yeah. never enough. It's like, I, this is kind of cliche and you'll hear it every Sunday morning, but it's like drinking salt water where it just makes you thirstier and you have yeah. to go deeper and deeper because it's like a nothingness. You're trying to reach out at sin and it's promising and there's no substance there. So maybe if I just get a little bit more, there'll be some more substance to satisfy me. Yeah. I only have 1 million. If I had 2 million, then I could buy that yacht I wanted. Yeah. Well, or with, with girlfriends, you know, wives or whatever. I yeah. mean, think about how much trouble Hugh Hefner could have saved himself. Yeah. He didn't have, because I don't think he topped Solomon. No. And he didn't have to even try that way, right? 
Mm -hmm. He could have just read what Solomon did and learned from wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in thinking about Solomon then, so we, we've seen, um, we've seen how he, he messed up in thinking about his rule over Israel was, does he fit the bill? We, we can see like um, Plato probably had Socrates in mind. And I've, I've read something about how this may have been a critique of the Athenians saying like, you need a philosopher King and you already killed him. So yeah. you guys are, you guys messed up. But then some people have said Marcus Aurelius is this philosopher king. Yeah. Uh, he's he, you know, I like his meditations, but they're really asystematic. They they don't fit together very well. But then well, it's a stoic, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, then you, Aurelius. Other my, others might say, well, how about Alexander? He's the direct descendant. You know, you got Plato, then Aristotle, and he taught yep. Yep. Uh, Alexander. And look at how he conquered the world. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do these these uh, yeah. These are great examples to highlight kind of the theme that we're making right now about the reality of sin and redemption. Yeah. So don't even forget, we're going to look at Psalm 72 about Solomon. Okay. But before we do that, let's look at those guys. Yeah. Do they have, there's the fear of the Lord. So, so Marcus Aurelius maybe has some good prudential things to say, but he's a stoic mm -hmm. who thinks all things are eternal in an eternal cycle. Yeah. And desire brings about suffering because you can't get anything that other than what's going to happen. So you just have to overcome desire. That's the highest level. So he's misunderstood reality and he's misunderstood the problem of evil. Yeah. And so he's proposed a false view of the good life. Yeah. So any prudential things he has do not overweigh those problems those are huge. Right. Right. And then he's claiming to teach people. Yeah. And we had a name for that kind of guy, right? That's we'll, we'll say there's first level hypocrisy, which is the standard fool. You, you think, you know, and you don't know. Yeah. Then there's second level hypocrisy where you're, in first level hypocrisy, but you're teaching others. Yeah. Well, that's the brood of vipers. And that's what he's at. Now, how about who else did we mention? Um, uh, we got, uh, well, we got Socrates himself. We also have Marcus Aurelius um, and Alexander. Socrates is a good negative example about dissenting when you realize they don't know. The rulers don't know. And so I'm not going to go along with them until they do know. Hmm. Not a good positive example of what we should know. Yeah. He's in the same boat as all the rest of us. Yeah. yeah. And then Alexander is a great example. Yeah. Literally. And, yeah. Yeah. He, he's great. Yeah, right. he shows up in Daniel. Yeah. Look for him in Daniel and see, is he, is he described as a wonderful person or is he just one of the things that happens in God's providence? And he, he burns out quite quickly compared right. to others. Yeah. And he didn't know, uh, he didn't have the fear of God. I mean, at best he was an Aristotelian. He seems to have begun to change towards the end of his life, maybe to like a more, uh, Zoroastrian view of things. Okay. Be curious to look and see. Uh, he adopted some outward forms of that. If he, it, it may be similar having married a Persian wife. Uh, okay. So yeah. What, but, but what good contribution did he give us? He didn't even provide a lineage for himself. Mm -mm. His yeah. own kingdom broke up immediately after his death. Yeah. How great is he? Yeah. Uh, and then um, was there another one? Oh, I think just, just down to Solomon himself. Yeah, Anderson's just shooting down all these rays. Well, again, if you're in, in the military and you have some relevant example for Saul, for Alexander's battles, like I don't know that it'd be relevantly applied today, but if you did, then that you could study him because I'm sure he had wisdom in those types of battles. Sure. Um, but about knowing the good life, man, it came far short. Yeah. yeah. The closest of the four kingdoms that Daniel mentions is Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. who was humble and yeah. did come to fear God. Yeah, gave us one of the greatest statements of God's sovereignty in, in yeah. all of scripture. So he'd be a good example, but look at how he look at how he had to do it. He didn't get there by conquering, by building. He did those things first. He got there by being humbled before God and learning the fear of God. And being conquered by God, right? Yeah. So that's what Marcus really doesn't do, Alexander doesn't do, but Nebuchadnezzar does do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so that's another example. Uh, but yeah, look at this. Um Psalm 72. If you want a, a psalm about the king. Now, this psalm, the title says a song of Solomon. I think it's generally understood to be a psalm for Solomon by David. Generally, okay. roughly on his deathbed. This is the last thing he would want. This is what he would want his son to know. Yeah. So he's going to describe here. What is a great king? But, of course, this also is messianic. It ultimately only applies to Christ. Yeah. But it's given to Solomon to guide Solomon. So you're talking earlier about 
yeah, what does Solomon have as he's growing up? Imagine your father writing on the Psalms and saying rule like this. Yeah. So he has all that input going in. So it's not just a kind of fideistic fear of the Lord. Yeah. I think if you have the fear of the Lord, here, here's what I, one of my main theses today. If you had the fear of the Lord, you could show the Lord is real. And if you can't do that, you haven't begun to fear the Lord. And that's inexcusable. You should repent of that. If you have the fear of the Lord, you should be able to show that he's real. Yep. And if you can't do that, you, you probably don't have the fear of the Lord. You don't have it, and you should repent of not being able to do that. In showing that it's real, do you mean like from, from your own life or being able to uh, give like a, a proof? or? I'm not going to rule out different ways of doing it. Okay. I don't want to say there's one way and one way only. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. given two examples from the Psalms. Yeah. Find it in Romans chapter 1. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of examples in Scripture. Now, I think those are examples of things we can all do from general revelation. Yeah. So can you show that these other things are idols and only God the Lord is eternal? Yeah. If you loved God, you could do that. And that's that's why fear and love go together. You, I know that some people might try to say, no, they used to fear God. Now we love God. Those actually yeah, go together. Out fear, right? What? Yeah, love casts out fear. Yeah, they might say something like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you're not always saying something like that. They're quoting scripture. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. you're also told to fear him who can cast your soul into hell. So you're going to have to either say the scripture contradicts itself right. or there's different senses of the word fear. Exactly. Yeah. So love goes with fear. If you loved God, think about Valentine. That's coming up. I saw, I don't want to tell you which story. You'll know where I shop. All right. It was Walmart. <laughs> uh, already has Valentine's Day stuff out. Wow. So if you have a Valentine and you know nothing about her, she's not going to be impressed with you. Yeah. If you write a Valentine's Day card that says, hey, you're really special, sign it, give it to her. That's not enough. Yeah. And that's a model of if we love somebody, we know all we can. We can't wait to know more about them. Yeah. So if you say, oh, I fear God. Well, how do you even know there is a God? I don't know. I think that works doubly too. Maybe you don't like this, but if you if you know all about your Valentine and you're sending her all sorts of letters and stuff, and she doesn't know you, or you don't have a personal relationship, that's called stalking, right? That's not that's right. not a relationship. That's not knowing, right? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll add that in. Remember back how we define different levels, like knowing, understanding, wisdom. So yep. someone could, if they're stuck at that first one, they might say, "This sounds too academic and abstract." Mm -hmm. You could list a bunch of things you know about God, but you don't have this personal relationship yet. Mm -hmm. Here's where I think the personal relationship comes in, and it is in knowing. You know who God is and that you weren't seeking God mm -hmm. and that you're able to repent of that to God. Yeah. And because of Christ taking your place, you're forgiven. Yeah. So all of that is what is called the personal relationship. Yeah. It's knowing things. Yeah. And even that, re that word repentance is it's come to mean like a, a fundamentalist on a sh uh, sandwich board. Repent because the yeah. end is near, but it, it means change metanoia, change your mind, change your mind. It, the Greek and the, and the Latin together give us a good picture because, of course, the Greek, you're right, uh, means to take a new direction mm -hmm. and to change your mind, repent, rethink. Yeah. So in other words, you could say, I rethought it and I was right the first time. I'm going to stick with what I had. Yeah. So the idea of rethinking it and changing your direction. Yeah. Well, uh, and I don't think we can we can dismiss the word repent because that's how Christ begins his ministry. Right. Yeah, and it's a good word. And board or, or sandwich board crazies. Yeah. No, you have to repent. That's yeah. the beginning of it all. I like that too. I think uh, I think we need to you know recapture that and and re-explain what it means. Um, especially, I mean, we talked about this off air, but as biblical literacy goes down. And these things are are just uh, tropes and, and weird things. We, just a little bit of explanation, and we get to keep the good word. Yeah. Well, and and this is where we're getting to biblical wisdom now, because mm -hmm. you won't see this in Plato or any other wisdom tradition. We're getting to the biblical wisdom, and I think it is displayed in the Beatitudes. Perhaps the Beatitudes are the height of the expression of biblical wisdom. Yeah. But Christ, of course, is raised in the Psalms, the Old Testament. He's bringing those into the Beatitudes and distilling it in such a perfect form. Yeah. And you need to be poor in spirit. I take poor in spirit to mean recognizing your own condition before God mm -hmm. and repenting of that. Yeah. Combine the Beatitudes with the word of repent. And that's the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom, not the end of it, just the beginning. If you haven't started, done that, you haven't even begun yet. And, and that's what we saw in Nebuchadnezzar, that God had to do that to him. He had made him poor in spirit by turning him into this 
this ghastly figure who's eating like a cow for yeah, seven years or a period. Of that yeah. If, if God wills it. Yeah. Right. Amen. So fear the Lord. And that's what we'll see in, in Proverbs. If someone approaches Proverbs without that, or they try to make the fear of the Lord into some uh, trope, like you fear darkness or something, you're not, you're not going to get the wisdom out of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Okay. So, so, um, Dude, that was that was fantastic. We got in there. Good. Uh, I want to talk. I want to finish up at least um, by talking about you. You just mentioned it. How Peterson hasn't started this series yet, um, but I know that he's going to look at Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly and see a dualism there and see. Look, it, this goes exactly with the the yin and the yang, and this is the order and the chaos, and and you need to find the the the, the middle ground between them because he he thinks of Christ as the the hero that you know, rides on the razor's edge between the, the yin and the yang that makes order out of chaos. Right. And what, what do we make of that? You know, I want to preempt well, that. Incidentally, let, let's get into it just by remembering that that's just the occultic teaching about Solomon, right? That there's these two mm -hmm. truths. Uh, and the highest teaching is that they're one. Yes. Yeah. One one. You have to learn. So you might, you might be on the dark side of magic. You might be on the light side of magic. But then it turns out they're both the same. All is one. The force, the, the, the light force. side of the force, the dark side of the force. It just depends on your perspective. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to be the background. But we don't have to go that way. And I don't think, of course, I don't think that's what at all that Solomon was involved in. It's like, it's like um, how any, I mean, how do the occultists interpret Christ? They view him as a spirit being who came into the world, maybe Michael, the archangel or something. And he came into the world and to teach us new things. So any worldview is going to take a figure and put it into their context. So they're doing that with Solomon. So for Peterson, yeah, he has these, these dualities he's got from Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. Now dualities are impossible to avoid because of the laws of thought. A yeah. is A, A is not non-A. So you're going to have duality. It's not a surprise they show up in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and incidentally, Hegel, it, 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 given a philosophy of history, is relying on these same dualities. I think he's part of that same monistic tradition, even though we talk about God a lot. Yeah. God is thinking world history to become conscious of himself. Mm -hmm. if he isn't already fully conscious. Yeah. And so you're part of that process. You're part of the divine process. Mm -hmm. That's what this other teaching is always saying is you, you are God or you can become God or something like that. Yeah. And it's the world becoming conscious of itself. And we're kind of these, it, there's all sorts of ways you can say it, but yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but he uses that thesis and antithesis uniting to produce a new level, mm -hmm. a new thesis. That conflict. Yeah. So that conflict, so Hegel to Jung to Peterson, mm -hmm. that inner conflict between a, a thesis and antithesis in your mind. Yeah. And you have to resolve those at a higher level, but that produces a new conflict that you have to resolve at a higher level. And the highest level you get to is just oneness. It's usually unconscious, non-cognitive awareness. Yeah. So it's for the Buddhist non-being because there's nothing even thinking anymore. For the Hindu, it's incorporation into Brahman, the highest conscious reality. Yeah. There's different versions of the same thing. Right. But none of that starts off the way Proverbs are. Mm-hmm with the fear of the Lord. So you could take bits and pieces of the Proverbs out and fit it into those systems. Sure. But as a system, the Proverbs are beginning with the biblical worldview. We already saw the root in the Psalms, which doesn't surprise us given his father and wisdom pursues that highest good. And folly doesn't. And the and part of the tension is folly thinks it does and doesn't. Yeah. So it loudly proclaims its view. So you don't want to walk the razor's edge between those. You only want wisdom. Right, right. Yeah, and and the, it's interesting as uh, the the listeners, you know, I encourage you to read through Proverbs. I'm Lord willing, I'll be making more and more of these and going through Proverbs one, two, just going through them, and you'll see Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly both call out. They're both saying, "Hey, come on, come turn in here, come turn in here." Uh, and Lady Folly, that's one of the good proofs to show how wisdom is. Available to all from general revelation, right? Uh, just in scripture, it is in scripture, but it's available to everybody. It's constantly calling you out. You don't have to go to the oracle at Delphi. Yes, it's it's in the streets. She calls out from the street. She's she's yeah, ever present. Come come to me. Come to me. Um, so yeah, we need to be wise in order to uh, 
evade Lady Folly, who is, you know, come on in here. You know, uh, forbidden fruit is it tastes better. You know, come on in here and, and leading you into more and more folly. And she's like the the archetypical archetypal uh, fool herself. Like you mentioned, the the second order fool who makes fools. Yeah, and that's, that's Lady Folly. She thinks she knows and doesn't know. And it's really the same temptation from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You can determine what's good for yourself. Yeah. You don't need God. Yeah. So it's not a new temptation and it's not some duality like the, the shadow side of wisdom. Right. Or he may get into how Christ is somehow the same as Lady Wisdom. Yep. But yeah, Sophia as wisdom is a important part of uh, usually occult traditions. Mm -hmm. Um Kabbalah, ne uh, look to see how that shows up in the Enneagram. All of these have that kind of thing where wisdom is one of the things in, in conflict. Might yeah. be the highest one where there's a duality and it sprinkles out into two different branches that have different ones you have to follow back up. Yeah. And none of those are starting off with the clarity of general revelation. Wisdom begins with, it's clear God exists. God made you, you didn't make yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's one reply, yeah, but God's distant now. We have to talk to the dead. No, you are no God's present, actively ruling in bringing about natural evil in your life to make you stop and think. That's what we saw with Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. And that's active rule. God's not distance. God is intimately involved in every day of your life. And and that revelation is continuous. Yeah. 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 So that, and that's what we see now. Questions people might want to have about Solomon. Did he repent? Was yeah. he a believer? Right. Uh yeah. I, I tend to think, yeah. Okay. I would want to ask what hinges, like before we get into like someone wants to debate about it for two hours, I want to see, well, could we spend those two hours better? Like how much hinges on it? Right. Um, but yeah, that would be my sense is he went into sin and did repent at the end. Yeah. And he is a believer. And he describes himself in a unique way, which is different from the rest of us. I talked about that earlier with, we don't have to go into excess because he already did. Right. Um, in a way we never can. Hugh Hefner didn't come close. Yeah. Uh, but he described himself as letting himself go that way and keeping wisdom while he did it. Mm -hmm. so that's a curious thing because you're like, wait, how can you stay wise and sin? And I think it's describing something unique about Solomon's situation as a revelation to the rest of the world. Yeah. So he didn't just go into these simply out of, say, lust. Yeah, he was he was testing. Yeah, right. Can this lead to the good life? And the answer is no. Yeah. Now, none of us can take that as license. Right. Exactly. Solomon said it. So I'm going to do precisely because Solomon did it. You can't do it. Right. If you did it now, you'd be doubly guilty because you ignore Solomon's revelation. Yes. And you'd be a fool. Yeah. And, and that way is already shut. The, the does do not enter. There's all sorts of cones. Don't even try it. Solomon did. Yeah. Better than you ever will anyways. Yeah. Right. So there's some, something about that that's unique about his condition. Yeah. I did this with, with wisdom, um, but the Lady Folly appeals to lust. And it's interesting how when our minds are darkened, when we're left to ourselves, we tend to go to two things, violence and lust, mm -hmm. physical power and lust. And we worship those two. Those are the two gods. If, if Peterson wants a uh, duality of gods, those are the two that tend to come down to us, right? Yeah. Uh, either uh, Zeus or Aphrodite. Yeah. One of those. Great point. And so she's offering that. There's there's a sense in which she's offering directly lust, but by giving into that, you're you're taking up a power to decide what's good for yourself. Yeah. And you're setting aside God. So we can unpack existentially all the things that's going on in her temptation. Yeah. That's I, I love I love that characterization you gave too. And and when I was in college and I wasn't following the Lord and I would get drunk, it was uh lust and power. You know, I wanted to fight someone and I was just lusting. And because any kind of discretion I had built up for myself, I was tearing down through being ine inebriated. Mm -hmm. And then those two things came back out. And uh, yeah, that's... I would uh, guess behind those was a lack of meaning. Mm. Would I be wrong about that? No, no, because I don't do those things anymore, right? I, I follow the Lord. I have a path to no, follow. What I mean is the, the altering our consciousness through drugs or alcohol... Oh, yeah is because this level of consciousness is not meaningful. Right. So I have to alter it to go to somewhere else. And then, as you said, other things follow from that. Yeah. So that's why I said, people might say, oh, I've never had those fruit sins. I was mm -hmm. never an unbeliever in college. No, but you had the same exact same root sin. Yeah. Uh, that you have to repent of. 
Yeah. And if for some reason you didn't go down that road, it's probably more just natural inclination. It's not something great that you achieved. Hmm. Uh, not you. I mean, the person who says, I didn't do those things. Right, right, right. right. But you also weren't seeking God. And that's yeah. what Solomon didn't do. That's what we're all in. Yeah. The root. And definitely, I brought up Psalm 72, and I guess we didn't we didn't look at it much, but it begins with, give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. Mm -hmm. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. So right, it begins with telling Solomon what he should want. Yeah. It translates into wisdom. Yeah. So when yeah. Solomon goes and says, and, and asks for what he wants, He's been taught by his father. Exactly. What yeah. You should want wisdom knowing how to rule these people that you've yeah. been given. And so it goes through there. And again, it's, this is ultimately pointing to Christ. You can't, Solomon yeah. didn't achieve all these things. Um, but imagine that getting that, that like your inheritance is one of the Psalms, right? Yeah. And, and it's cool to see Solomon followed on his father's advice wisely. And when God said, what do you want? He said, I want, I want, I want wisdom to rule these people. And God says, well, because you asked for wisdom, I'll give yeah. that to you and more. Yeah. But look at how the psalm ends in 18 to 20. Mm -hmm. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And then here's how we know this is the last. This is the psalm, probably the last psalm of David. It ends that way in 20. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So mm -hmm. although it says a psalm, of Solomon is probably a psalm to Solomon because the end verse 20 tells us this is the, the end of the prayers of David. Yeah. And what a powerful ending verse 18 and 19. Our goal should be the same thing as David's the earth being filled with the glory of God. Yeah. And that those are from the knowing the wondrous works of God. Mm. How, how opposite is that from Platonism and the yeah. beatific vision and fleeing this world to go somewhere else? Right. We yeah. should fill the world with the glory of what God's done. And that includes the reality of suffering. That's what that's what Nebuchadnezzar was able to do. That's what Job was able to do. They didn't say, you have to just overcome desire, and then you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. No, God was ruling in this to call me back to himself. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. I, I wanna I wanna finish with um with Christ as the philosopher king. And you've you've alluded to it already several times. So uh Christ or Solomon and and David and the whole Davidic kingship is an archetype for or Christ is the, the true archetype of that right and so Christ yeah, he's figure yeah he's the, yeah the typology ends with Christ and we see this figure who humbled himself you know Christ is truly God truly man he humbled himself by taking the form of a a child right he was born uh, to a, a poor virgin. Um, and he, he started with humbling himself. He's always been uh, fearing the Lord, you know, in, in his human nature. And he, for, he he rides in on a donkey, right? So this is the the true philosopher king. Would, would you call Christ, is, is it appropriate to call him the true philosopher king? Or what do you think? Well, I don't think it's mistaken. Mm -hmm. I would want to think about what, it, what baggage it brings in with us because of the history of that term. Yeah. But I do think... I'm working on a series right now on Luke where mm -hmm. I'm especially looking at the way that Christ proceeds, how many times he's bringing in truths from general revelation mm -hmm. in arguing. Yeah. Uh, and then clearly, obviously the old Testament, which was scriptures for him. Yeah. So, and parables, right? Yeah. Yeah. When he brings in, yeah, the parables often are highlighting general revelation truths. Yeah. So my, well, they're in the Bible. So they're special revelation. Yes, they are, but they're highlighting something that's a, like, don't be divided. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Right. Uh, the way that understanding grows, a little bit of misunderstanding fills the whole mind. Yeah. So those are truths that we can know. So I think that's right. I mean, he's the example of how to reason. Mm. And someone could say, well, yeah, but he talks in parables. He never gives us a clear proof the way Descartes did. That's what I'm looking for. I think that same person will miss all that can be unpacked from the fear of the Lord that you and I just did. Yeah. And will miss the things I pointed out in the Psalms. Mm hmm as a kind of literalist and the way that Christ taught is going to speak across the board in any context. Yeah. So you can get an analytic argument out of it if you need that. Mm -hmm. um, but he's not presenting that way because he's expecting you to do some of the reasoning. Yeah. And that's uh, just like in, in, in the Proverbs one, it's for the wise as well. And so the wise, it takes wisdom to further understand wisdom. To take yeah, so if, you, if you're teaching a way that juxtaposes ideas that you mm -hmm. should know, 
and requires you to connect them, then it puts a standard up for those who are seeking and those who aren't seeking. Yeah. Which isn't there if you just say premise one, premise two, conclusion. Yeah. So what Christ's words do is he, he says this, they, they're they hiding the things from those who shouldn't know and revealing them to those who should know. Yeah. If you're seeking, you'll get this. Yeah. And, and I think that's that again, that's the, the, um, the wisdom aspect of, uh, properly applying knowledge. And so I, I think of those, those analytic arguments, which I like, but, um, it, it like you said, there's not a, a wisdom component. There's, it's not like a, uh, I, I think of wisdom more of like a choose your own adventure book. And if you're wise, you'll find the right answer at the end. Yeah. And it takes wisdom to follow that. And if you're not, then you're going to be happy being, uh, you know, ending on the fifth page. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I find. Perhaps it's sort of a brief way to describe the analytic and continental traditions, mm -hmm. but the analytic tradition, and that's what I was trained. In, I, I've done both. So I don't have both have things to offer, yeah. but the analytic tradition tends to, inculcate a kind of literalism yep. where people aren't able to think past very direct literal statements. And it's what the continental tradition will critique it for. Yeah. But the continental tradition loves to develop what I call maybe contrast literalism with allegoricalism. Mm -hmm. They love to just enjoy the multiple meanings of a symbol and get into the depth of what you could argue about and poetic meanings. And so the analytic will say, that's all not nonsense. It doesn't mean anything. And the, the Connell says, no, you don't realize how many levels there are we could just explore here. Yeah. And so it's a kind of false antinomy, literalist versus allegoricalism. And we've seen that even in the history of biblical interpretation. Yes. Those yeah. two. But the parable, I think, is a third option, which is context. If you understand the context of the biblical worldview, you'll put together the pieces correctly of the parable. Yeah. And the biblical worldview goes back to God the creator. It's clear that God exists. God created to reveal himself, natural evil comes after moral evil as a callback, and moral evil is putting ourselves in the place of God. Yeah, that those pieces which are right away in Genesis one through three get developed more and more throughout the whole scripture. And if you don't start with those, you, yeah, you won't get the parable. Yeah, yeah, that's so great. I, I have to share the story about the uh, analytic continental divide real quick. I, yeah. I talked about it in one of the earlier podcasts, but I, I forgot the, the philosopher's name. Um, this might be in the Liar Paradox episode, so go back and watch that if, if you guys haven't or listened on the podcast. But uh, there's this this Jewish philosopher, and um, it's uh, the story that I that I read in. It's it's uh, exemplifying Jewish uh, irony. He's a Jewish philosopher. He said we can use uh, two positives and get a negative. And J. L. Austin, the uh, the founder of speech act theory, is all perturbed by this. No, you can't. You can't get that. Doesn't make any sense. And so then he goes through a whole proof. They finally get together and. Uh, Austin goes through a whole proof why you can't get a negative from two positives. And after it's all done, uh, the, the Jewish philosopher goes, yeah, yeah. And it's like that, that continental analytic divide right there. So perfect. But um, right. Right. I love that. Dr. Anderson, um, can you, can you wrap this up in a, in a bow for us? Uh, what, what we've discussed about uh, Plato, philosopher Kings, Solomon, and then, and then Christ to, can you, can you put a bow on it for us? Yeah, we've looked at Plato and how he defined the philosopher king, but really the system of thought mm -hmm. behind Plato or behind Aristotle, and how that system of thought, call it Greek dualism, although both Plato and Aristotle have different versions, is contrary to the biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a fideistic way, like, well, we just start with the Bible. I mean, we can know from general revelation, only God's eternal, and God's not the demiurge or the unmoved mover. So we started there that if, if we had wisdom— we have to begin with that. We'd have to begin with the fear of the Lord. And so we unpack that idea of what, what it means to fear the Lord. And I said this, which I think should be a little bit controversial in a good way. If you feared God, you could show God is real. Yeah. And then I gave examples from that in the Psalms, hmm. let alone in, say, Romans 1. Right. So this is not a foreign idea, but I think some people might say, no, I, I mean, I, I'm really close to God, but it doesn't mean I have to show God exists. So I want that to be a little uncomfortable because I think that is the root sin we all have to repent of. Hmm. We overestimate how well we're doing. And I say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm pretty good doing, doing well with God. But the truth yeah. is no one seeks, no one understands, no one does what is right. And that's where the fear of the Lord comes in. Yeah. We recognize uh, God is the one who has the power to do something about that. Yeah. 
So I think this whole discussion, which maybe some, probably if people have tuned in, they like this sort of thing, but someone else might say, look, this is just too abstract. I just want a straightforward, simple uh, yeah. faith. Well, okay. We're inexcusable for unbelief. We have to repent of that. That's the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. So what I hope we've done today is we've wed general and special revelation to show how much philosophy, which I would say that's general revelation, how much philosophy Solomon was doing mm -hmm. and the psalmists were doing. Yeah. And and so we don't have to say there's the Bible versus philosophy. There's the Bible versus worldly philosophy. Yeah. But we should love wisdom and be pursuing it. Yeah. Man, amen. I can't wait for uh, for that book on Job to come out. We, you got to come back and talk about that as uh, oh, some more. You got to come back and, and help us with some more Proverbs, man. This has been so fantastic. Thanks for, for all your work laying this out. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad to be back. We have great discussions, so it's always a lot of fun. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, so uh, we could do this some more. Lord willing, we're, we're going to, uh, but for now it's going to have to do it. Uh, this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God. <laughs>